And I'm going through all my makeup interviews too. I'm focused on learning objectives right now. But during finals week, I will take uh, you know one last pass over all the application objectives. Just to see if anybody fell through the cracks. I also have, once I process everything, I'll give an invitation. There will be a Google form where you can dispute anything. You want to complain about any grade you don't think is fair or anything. Uh, or you don't think is more ac- uh, accurately recorded, more specifically. You'll be able to let me know about that. So I'm not going to let anything slip through the cracks. I, I, for some of you, you might have to sweat it out just a little bit. I'm, I apologize for that. There's just a lot of moving pieces right now. Uh, but I uh, will get everybody there. Friday lecture is just among us. <clears throat> Alright, oh, sh- I was, uh, I was scrolled up on chat, shoot. You be Marcos, nice. It's always good to get that email. What's up, mail? Uh, Mayo Lolan? Mayo Lolan? <laughs> Am I? Yeah, maybe I'm the clone. You never thought about that. The real Jesse was in chat yesterday. I'm the imposter. You're the blue dab of the green square. Oh, yeah. Oops. I'm in the wrong screen. Alright. So let's do this. So, this is uh, what I, a game I call Towers. This uses only technologies that you've learned in the course. You could build this game with what you know and mostly with what you've already done in this course. So, we have players. We can all play. You can go to the, the site that I linked in chat, jessehartloff.com. It's easy for me to remember, at least. And you move around. I move around. We can see each other. We can both interact with the game. When we get close to these towers, they're going to shoot at us. And our goal is to get to that base, that square, just to the left of me. We got to get to that, and as we do, it's going to reduce its shade of color. This is basically uh, what I would call a tower offense game. So we're storming the towers and trying to damage the base by getting to that base. Oops, I died. Um, once we get to the base enough and the color completely fades, it'll move on to the next level. And then there's only, I think, four levels that I made for this. Uh, and it'll just keep cycling through those levels. So if we get to this base, we can see the damage being dealt. I think this is an AI player next to me. Nice. We got him in. Oh, and I didn't get in. Um, but once we damage the base enough, uh moves on to the next level. Let's see if Spotlight's on. Blue, blue player. <laughs> All right. Um, so that's the game that I want to talk about today. So let me switch over to the slides. And I want to explain the architecture. Oops, that's not slides. Uh, the architecture of how that game works. Now that you have an idea of what the game actually is. If I completed only one homework, how can I get two expansions? There are tons of ways you can get two expansions. Uh, so any homework you didn't do throughout the semester, you can do it as an expansion objective. So you have lots of options and any of the act, the named expansion objectives. It's like if you didn't do calculator and you do calculator as one expansion and then the expansion on calculator as your second expansion, you can get them both done. But yeah, expansions can't make up for homework though. So if you miss a deadline, you didn't get an extension or you didn't make it by the extended deadline, you can't get that application objective for that homework but you can still use that homework as an expansion objective. So I know it's a little bit confusing, but um, but you do have opportunities to make up things you missed. But the five homework application objectives, those are the five things that I'm really using as checkpoints throughout the course, where you have to complete them by a certain time. If you're not keeping up with things, you lose those opportunities. Um, it's really the only checkpoints that I have in this course, but I, I need some sort of checkpoint to push you along in the course or else everybody waits till the last day and then fails which unfortunately a lot of students are doing uh i hope they're able to pull it off <clears throat> okay so let's get through this because i want to do review there is a piazza post asking for review topics that i have open over here we'll go to some of those after i'm done with the slides here the slides won't take up the entire lecture time uh so for wednesday and friday 
those lectures, I'm solely going to be looking at that Piazza post for lecture content. There's a lot of requests, a lot for learning objective for lecture questions right now. Uh, so that's what we'll, we'll be talking about a lot, talking about the data structures. So, uh, so if there's something that you want covered during this review week, the, after these last few slides that I have to cut, uh, that I want to cover, uh, let me know through that Piazza post. It's, uh, it's pinned. It's the second pinned post right now, review week lecture topics. That's where I want to hear from you. And, uh, and vote, please vote on the topics that are already there. So all the upvotes, some of them have three, some of them are up to four upvotes. Those are the ones I'm going to cover first. <clears throat> okay, so this is an MMO. Uh, you've probably heard the acronym at least before, uh, if you haven't played these uh, potentially extensively. But a massive multiplayer online app. Uh, it's They're typically games, but they can be any experience where many users are interacting with each other. And I usually add the stipulation that it should be in real time. Uh, I don't know if that's technically, uh, uh, you know, we could split hairs on the definition and say email is technically an MMO. Um, but I like to see real time interaction between players. That's what I really call an MMO. Uh, and then there are different genres of MMOs. MMO RPG, for example, uh, you've probably heard of. Um, but we want something where players can interact with each other in real time through the internet. That's really our goal. And we have the technologies to do that right now. I just want to show you the architecture of one app, well, actually two today, of putting it all together. What's up, Liam? So let's take a look at this. Oh, yeah, and chat app technically was also, but, you know, it's not as interesting as, uh, you know, a whole game. And, uh, I mean, chat app, yeah, it's an MMO, but, eh, you know. So here's the architecture of the actors, uh, actor structure. So the ar actors, uh, actors, the towers architecture. So let's go through this one piece at a time. There actually is no database in towers. The game just runs on a loop, and if I restart the server, it just restarts at uh, at level one or level zero, I think I called it, and uh, just starts the game. There's nothing that needs to be remembered, no data that needs to be stored. There's no usernames, things like that. Uh, it doesn't remember player locations on a server restart or anything. So, uh, so no database, but we have all the other pieces of the architecture that we've seen. Excuse me. So let's start from the user. Uh, this is effectively our view. It is a web app. So the view, ugh. so the view is strictly in the browser through HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Uh, that's where the user is interacting. The player is going to connect. The player is going to download our CSS, JavaScript, HTML, all the front end stuff onto their machine, render that in their browser, run the JavaScript in their browser, and then also connect to our WebSocket server to be able to interact in real time. The WebSockets, that's the technology that we explored this semester, that's going to let us interact with other users in real time through that server. Uh, we are using Nginx. If somebody really wants to learn about that uh, to that degree and how to deploy these apps. There was some call for it in chat Friday, I believe. Uh, if that is something you want to see, head over to Piazza, uh, make a post on the review topics. Uh, I'd be happy to cover that stuff. Um, but only if there's demand. I got to see enough upvotes on it to be able to go into Nginx, Docker, uh, and explore those topics that are used in the project contribution projects. I'd love to talk about them, but only if there's demand. I think there's more demand for lecture questions. Uh, so we use HTTP and WebSockets to connect to the server, both a, an Nginx server and a WebSocket server, where the WebSocket server is the Scala portion of our code. Uh, the user is going to, the front end is going to be the view and part of the controller, get the entire state of the game from the WebSocket server, and then render it to the user. So it's getting the, the location of all the walls, all the towers, all the projectiles, the towers are firing, and all the other player locations. The base location, the base health, to know what color to render it. All of that information is set in one big old JSON string. And then the JavaScript renders that string and displays it to the user. So the user can see the current state of the game visually. The, the front end also collects user inputs. It's taking... It's not sending keystrokes directly. 
there is some controller work deciding which key is being held down currently. So it's going to send the state of each key to the web server every time the state of your keys change. So if you press uh, press the A button to move left, that is being that signal is being sent to the web server, the socket server, and then when you release that key, a new key state is being sent to the web server to update. Say, hey, this user released the A button, and then the server is processing all the keystrokes. That's a by no means is this the only way to to build an MMO. I'd say this is a pretty rare way to build an MMO. Uh, like uh, Google Stadia does this, where you're basically watching a video of the game and then sending your key inputs to the server and everything's processed on the server. So it's more following more of that architecture. A lot of times you would put more rendering work on the front end to use, you know, the clients, the users hardware to process all that stuff instead of using your server. Um, uh, but I went with more of a Google Stadia architecture here. Uh, by no means the only way to do things. So I want to make sure that's that that's said. So we send the states, key states to the server. The server processes everything and then sends the final game state, the current game state, to the front end. <clears throat> the WebSocket server is going to get... Oh, I did that a little weird, uh, pictorially. Uh, this, is, this isn't WebSockets. This is, these are one big server. This is the same server. Uh, so the server is going to process that information, those key states, and decide where that player is going to move. It's going to handle all the graphics, or not the graphics. It's going to handle all the physics of that movement. Did this player move into a wall? Did this player move into a bullet? Did this player move into a base, etc.? And uh, control all that. The WebSocket server, just like we did for Clicker and the DM server, does have to keep track of each WebSocket and keep track of which player that corresponds to. So if I get a new key state saying, hey, I'm holding down W and D, I want to move up and to the right, the WebSocket server needs to say, okay, I'm receiving this message on this socket, therefore it must be affiliated with this player and then update the proper player. So we need to listen to the connected and disconnected messages as well so we can maintain our data structures, maintaining that information. This WebSocket is for this player, so I know which player, so the server knows which player to move. When the game state updates, which it does 10 times a second for, for this, which is just a constant, I can change that to whatever frame rate I want. Um, with 10 frames, 10 times a second, the server is going to update and then broadcast that game state to all, uh, all users. That's uh, that's an artifact. That slide shouldn't exist. Uh, so the first instance of this, when I first built towers, we were actually using Python and a TCP socket server and also web socket servers. That's why I missed this. I changed TCP to web sockets, but missed it. But this previous slide I should have deleted as well. TCP socket server doesn't exist. And then the web socket server, this is listening for all those connections of the users, listening on port 8080. Whenever a WebSocket connection is made, update data structures, send it, uh, add it to the list to broadcast the game state to all of the uh, connected players. Its main job is pretty much the same as the main job in Clicker. I use very similar architectures for both of these, where the WebSocket server is a WebSocket server, obviously, and also an actor in the actor system. So the this the task of this module is to convert between actor messages and WebSocket messages. So when it gets a WebSocket message, converts it to an actor message, sends it to the game actor in the actor system. Game actor sends it messages and it converts to a WebSocket message. And also keeping track of which WebSocket pertains to which player. Uh, so mostly just logistics and mostly forwarding messages is what the WebSocket server does. And it's very important, it, even though it doesn't have much logic or do much work itself, it's very important that we have that uh, we have that encapsulated into a separate module for a very important reason we'll see later. Uh, this, the short, the TLDR of it is it makes things easier to expand. It makes it easier to add features, which has been a theme throughout this course. Easier to add new features. 
the game actor is of course part of the actor system but it also it's made up with of two separate parts and uh those parts are the game actor itself and also a game class this is important the it to keep these separated as well again for modularity for expansion expanding this uh reusing code and everything um so the game actor is effectively part of our controller and the websocket server and uh and half of the front end are all part of our controller just taking user inputs and converting them into calls to our api the to the games api so we have a game class that has a small list of API methods that can be called. And by the time the game actor gets these signals from the WebSocket server, it's going to convert them into API calls and tell the game, hey, this is happening. Uh, and specifically, it's going to say, move this player or to this location or stop this player's movement. Uh, zero out their velocity. Uh, or yeah, set, either set their velocity to an intended velocity or zero out their velocity. Those are the two actions that the game has in its API. And that's all it has. Everything else is internal logic. That's the only two, way, two ways that um, players can interact with the game. Set their intended velocity. I say intended because if you try to move into a wall, the game's going to stop you. Or stop this player, as in you released all the keys, you're going to get a stop message sent to the game or a stop call to its API. Uh, this game does not know that it's part of an actor system, much less part of a WebSocket uh, server and a WebSocket system, much less uh, an HTML, JavaScript, CSS, web front end. The game doesn't know or care, and that's where we want encapsulation. This game could be reused and used as a desktop game, um, as a mobile gap game, as a mobile app. You know, it can be reused in any different context because it's completely separated from all of the other logic that makes it uh, all the other controller and view the game is the uh, the model which can be reused with other controllers in views and the towers we're going to leverage that actor system quite a bit here so with actors we didn't see this much or really at all throughout the semester but one of the advantages of using actors is that we can have code running concurrently without affecting the other concurrently running code. So each tower in this game is its own actor and it controls it, it, it does its own computation to figure out where to fire separately from the other actors. So these are just more actors in the system. So specifically, if the towers take a long time to figure out where to aim, and we'll see that these towers actually do use the genetic algorithm to figure out where to shoot, that these towers, if if your genetic algorithm is pretty sloppy, if it's very inefficient, the towers are going to take a long time to compute where to shoot. But since they're part of an actor system running concurrently along with the game code, the game can still react to user inputs and users can still move around in the game, even though the tower is taking up a lot of processing power, a lot of CPU time. It's not going to hold up the rest of the game. So the game still runs smooth. Players can all move, the web socket server, all that stuff still works and functions properly, but the towers will seem laggy, but they don't drag the entire game down with them. And that's an important part of having concurrently running code. If we have one really slow piece of code or multiple pieces of slow running code, it doesn't affect the rest of the system. Uh, so with this, if you play, the, you play the game, you see it on jessieharloff.com, you see that there are AI characters those aren't just very perfect systematically moving uh, players. It's very hard if you just try, I've tried before simulating an AI, just pretending that I was an AI character. It's almost impossible to mimic them. Uh, it's clear when there's a, a human player. So I believe I have five of those on the live server. There are five AI characters. So how would we do this in here if we were you know, in a big lecture hall or if I had a little more time I wanted to spend, I wanna to get to more review style topics, but. Uh, I would say, let's talk about this. How would you add uh, AI characters? And we'd have a good discussion. Uh, I'm going to skip that uh, today and just uh, move on through this. Is I have AI, AI actors communicating with the game actor. So just like the WebSocket server takes WebSocket messages from a human player, converts them into actor messages, and sends those messages to the game actor, 
uh, actor, so the game actor, we're going to create an AI controller as an actor, add that to the actor system. It's going to create AI actors, add those to the actor system, and they're going to compute where they should move and then send those messages to the game actor class using the same actor message type that the WebSocket server is using. So the game actor from the WebSocket server, from the game actor's perspective, from the WebSocket server, it's getting messages that say, uh, this player wants to move this way, or this player wants to stop. And from the AI, it's getting messages that says, this player wants to move this way, this player wants to stop. The game actor does not care whether those messages originated from a keyboard press from a human being or from a pathfinding algorithm for an, from an AI actor. To the game actor, all players in this game are exactly the same, and they just have to send the right actor messages to get that those movements processed. And then the game actor sends those messages to the game through the API calls. The game is even further removed. It doesn't care where these messages came from, just that it knows which players to move. So AI players and human players are exactly the same from the game actor downward. The game actor, the game, towers, the towers are going to look for players to shoot. doesn't care if they're AI or human. There's no distinction between them uh, outside of the uh, inside the game actor and beyond. Yeah, you, you just leave your computer on all the time is the, the short answer. When people talk about a web server, like I have this hosted on a server, that's really what they mean. They just mean there's a computer somewhere that's on all the time. Uh, and usually they're, they use the same style of hardware that we use in our desktops and laptops, but they're usually shaped a little bit differently just so they can fit in a server rack. Uh, but it's all the same technologies. They have RAM sticks, they have hard drives, they have CPUs. Uh, typically they um, isn't that unsafe for a virus? Um, not really. They're leaving your computer on all the time. I wouldn't see why. I mean, web server, you got to focus on web server security because people can hack you. You got to be protected against that. But, um, but just having your computer on all the time. Yeah, we do, we're, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole though. Uh, so, so this is how we add AI to the game. And we can do this easily because we have some everything encapsulated quite well. We have the model view and controller all separated. We're effectively adding a new controller here. So we have a controller for human players, a controller for AI players, and we're using them both concurrently. And the one model doesn't just doesn't care. The model doesn't care uh, that there are two different controllers that are converting inputs from different sources to API calls. All right. So you can imagine if we had the game actor and the WebSocket server all jammed into one giant file and all of that functionality was all intermixed and the game was just taking WebSocket messages directly, it's going to be much more difficult to add those AI to this game. Uh, you're going to end up with a mess of a project, a mess of a code base. It's going to be a lot tougher to add those things. <clears throat> or if you want to change it to a desktop app and you got to rip apart the web stuff from the game logic, uh, separating that could be very difficult if you don't have a, a better design from the start. All right, let's uh, quickly jump over to some code. Uh, this might be, I realize this might be a bit overwhelming, um, but I'm going to quickly go through the towers code. I, I can't make this code available to you, but I'll scroll through parts of it right now as we, for that, that towers code. But we have a, uh, the, the towers WebSocket server, which is also an actor. So again, similar to the clicker assignment. We're going to have our data structures to remember, actually, I don't need the the map into the actor refs, but uh, to remember the clients and who they whom they refer to. Listen for connections, disconnections to update those data structures and listen for their key states. That's the only input that uh, that the users have. Send me the key states, 
key states are going to be processed based on which keys are held down currently. And that's going to determine the movement, the intended velocity, if you will, of the uh, of that player. The server is going to update the game every 32 milliseconds. It's also going to update the uh, the server. So this is going to update the game and say, hey, game, update yourself. And then staggered from that, so every 32 milliseconds, but on off beats, is that the right term? It's going to send the game state to all of the web sockets. So it's going to give the game time to process all the physics and all the updates and all the change to the game state, and then send that game state to all of the connected users. And every 100 milliseconds, tell the AI to update its pathfinding, make sure that it's on the right path to find that base. The tower, this is this one I want to highlight. There's just a few things I want to highlight through here. I'm obviously not going to go through the whole code base. There's quite a bit here. Uh, each tower is represented as an actor in the system. And I want to highlight how the towers fire. So a tower is going to send this send game state message to the server as an actor message. When it receives that, when it receives the send game state message, it's going to do exactly what it says. It's going to send the I'm in the wrong one game actor. Uh, send game state is a request to the game. We'll get to the game class that says, Hey, can you send me the current state of the game? The most recent update up to date game state. It's going to send that game state back in a response. When a tower receives the game state from the game, it knows it has the most up-to-date state of the game. I keep clicking the wrong one. Sorry about that. It knows it has the most recent up-to-date state of the game. It's going to update that. And it's going to tell itself to fire. Send itself this fire message. When it's told to fire, so anybody could tell a tower to fire if uh, something else wants to prompt a, a tower to fire. It's going to fire, and it's going to look at that game state and decide which direction to fire. Once it does fire, it's going to wait one second and then send itself the send games, uh, send the game actor the game state message in one second through the scheduler and start the process again. So it's going to send send game state, receive the game state, send itself fire, receive fire, send send game state, receive game state, send fire, receive fire. So it's caught in an infinite loop with a one second delay between each time it fires. How it decides to fire? Well, that's genetic algorithm. So it's going to use aimbot right from the homework and fire using that uh, using that code the game actor has these four uh, four actor messages well five actor messages well a few more well, well hold on. Uh, this is the API four actor messages for its API we can add and remove players we can move a player and we can stop a player and moving a player sets its velocity, its intended velocity, so it can move around. And then some uh, kind of, not API, but more uh, features that are going to make uh, you know everything work together. Updating the game, a way to access the game state that we saw that Towers asked for the game state, received the game state. The server also asks for the game state and then broadcasts that to all the web sockets. Uh, and adding projectiles, towers are going to add projectiles. It's are going to add projectiles once it decides where to fire. It's going to add that projectile to the game uh, using an actor message. I guess that is part of the API, isn't it? Just not part of the movement. And... And then the game itself is a separate class. This is going to control, uh, you know, uh, player movement, uh, whether a player got hit, what to do when they got hit, 
you know, moving them back to the starting location. If a base takes damage, reducing the base health, things like that. Uh, and some good old fashioned JSON, converting that game state into a big old JSON string is something that we have to do once every tenth of a second. So we better have some code to do that. The game uses physics engine right from the homework. It's using that physics to figure out the movement, the collisions when a player walks into a wall. That's going to be a static collision, a collision between a dynamic and static object. Uh, we have a little bit extra. We do have dynamic collisions because the tower projectiles are also dynamic objects. So a projectile hitting a player, that's a collision detected by our physics engine using the expansion objective. And uh, uh, and updating all the physics. So everything works on velocities. Uh, the towers set the velocities of their projectiles. The players set their intended velocity. And then the physics engine takes care of it after that. The, uh, except, you know, projectiles and walls decide what they're going to do on a collision. Ooh, this works a little bit different than the current version of physics engine. Uh, so let's not go into the details there. But, uh, and the range of a tower. So the tower has a certain height. When it fires a projectile, that projectile is affected by gravity. And when it hits the ground, that's when the projectile is removed from the game. So the towers don't have an inherent range. They just have a they have a height that they're firing from and a an initial velocity for those projectiles. And that's going to determine how long it takes. Well, actually, just the height does. Determines how long it takes before that ball hits the ground, that projectile hits the ground. Then the velocity is going to determine how far it travels before it hits the ground. So we have physics engine. We have genetic algorithm. And we have pathfinding. The AI, to be able to find, this is probably the most obvious one looking at the, the game. The AI are finding that shortest path using breadth first search to be able to navigate from the start to the end. So we have the solutions to three separate homeworks. That's why I can't show too much code here. But we have the solution to three separate homeworks to be able to get this project running. And part of why we can do that is because we have these homeworks in a way that they can be reused in other projects. We These weren't really the initial applications of these projects, of these homework assignments, but we can reuse them in new projects that we reimagine. We can reuse all this code. That's what we want out of our code. Uh, and I think that's all I want to highlight here. Uh, game actors, AI actors, send the game actor the messages where I, this is where I intend to move or I intend to stop. Uh... I think that's all I want to highlight. Let me check chat before we go on to the next thing. I haven't used kite. I don't even know what that is, to be honest. Uh, recommend. I I like, uh, I don't know, I like IntelliJ's prediction already. I think it does pretty good. Uh, a pretty good job. I don't have a, I don't feel a need to improve it. No questions about towers. I guess everybody understood everything about that. <laughs> uh, I, I know that was a lot. That was That's way too fast to really digest, but I wanted to give a high level of uh, how different modules can interact with each other. That's the main part of why I want to go in there. I don't really expect you to understand all the code of that because it's way, just way too fast. I, I would have to take at least two lectures, I think, to really explain to you how towers work. Uh, but I wanted to go over it at a high level just to show you that all these different pieces of code and different technologies can all interact. And to show you that I'm not pulling any punches. You can build towers. G given the problem statement, this is what the game is supposed to do. You could go build that right now with the technology you have. It might take you a while. That would be a, a huge project, a huge homework assignment or a semester long project. It could be doable for that. Uh, but you can do it. There's nothing in there that you haven't seen before. Uh, all right, so, geez, time goes fast. Uh, so let's circle back around way back to week two. That example, that proof of concept MMO, this is something uh, a bit more tame that you can definitely fully understand at this moment. And it, But it is more of a proof of concept that we can build an MMO and get real-time user interaction. 
This is the week two app that you ran way back when. Let's close the course out, the content with this, and then go into review. Uh, so each player opens up a browser window, a browser tab, moves their mouse around, and everybody can see each other's movement based on those mouses, mice uh, examples. So let's jump back to the code. Let's see if I can figure this out in a better way than last time. Towers. Hey, that worked. All right. Last time it didn't want to play nice with me, but today it worked quite well. So the MMO proof of concept here. Got this. If I move my mouse around in one window, I can see that movement in another window. This works with internet technologies. This, these could be two different users anywhere on the planet, and they can see their cursors. Now, of course, you would add things like once you get close to each other, maybe you can click to attack other players or, or whatever you want um, to build out the rest of the game. But I wanted to keep this as simple as possible. And I do give you the code for this, obviously, because you ran it in week two. It's in the examples repo. Uh, so you could use this as a start if you want to build your own MMO and build your own web apps and uh, take use of make use of this technology that you've learned. Uh, feel free to take this code, this week 13 MMO code. And use that as your start. You can rip off my code. I don't care. Uh, anything in this example's repo, by the way, is oh, fair game. You can uh, you can use that. I'll let you use that in anything uh, for whatever purpose you want. So for this, we have one main message that we're listening to over the WebSocket server is the location message. Of course, connect and disconnect to remove players. If I close one of those tabs, one of those players, that player is going to disappear for that tab. Uh, so connect and disconnect are going to maintain the, the data structure to be able to make sure that I'm mapping sockets to characters using this character object, which doesn't do much, but it keeps track of the XY position of that player. The big message that we're listening for is the location. Each player is going to send its location of the mouse and then remember that uh, and broadcast that to other players. So we listen for location. Location listener is going to update the data structure for that socket. It's going to update the X and Y in that data structure. Every 33 milliseconds, I have it set for right now, so 30 frames per second, we're going to broadcast, or we're going to send the update message, which is going to broadcast the game state to all of the connected web sockets. So I'm not bothering with my data structures here. I'm just saying send the game state to everybody. And we're going to send that as a JSON. We'll have some JSON uh, building using that JSON play library to be able to get the, uh, the game state sent to all players and send it to all of them. And that's really most of it. Only one message type. Uh, so that's really most of it. And then the rest is on the web front end. For this, it, uh, I used the GUI concepts that we saw in Scala with Scala FX. And I'm using, uh, geez, what was the other one I wanted to highlight? Uh, event listeners, I guess just the GUI stuff. So I, I used GUI stuff, uh, those concepts, but in JavaScript. So if you're interested in using it, using this canvas, this gives us a way to draw shapes in the browser, just like we did with, uh, in the GUI examples in class. So I'm going to have ways to, when I get the game state, have ways to draw those squares on the GUI, similar to what we did in Scala. I guess I said that a few times already. Uh, it's a little bit different. First, what I'm going to do is remove everything from the entire, uh, the entire rectangular area for the canvas, remove the entire thing, and then draw all the players from the game state on there. And I'm gonna check the socket ID. I'm sending the ID of each player. And if that ID equals my socket ID, make sure that appears as a different color so I know who I am. And Towers does something similar. 
I, I want to know who I am. So uh, make that a different color based on that unique ID. And then add a listener. Same syntax as we used before. This is an event-based architecture. And I'm going to listen for the event called mouse move. This is part of JavaScript. It's part of the browser. This is a, a named event. If you name it, you're, if you put the event name exactly mouse move, you're going to react to mouse movement events. From that event, you can get the X and Y coordinates of the mouse, the mouse cursor. And I'm going to send that to the server. I'm going to emit that over the socket to send it to the server. As long as I'm, I've waited at least 16 milliseconds in this case, we can adjust this update interval. But when I move the mouse, I don't want to send a thousand messages over the web socket. So there's a little bit of a delay uh, just to make sure that uh, that the uh, server isn't going getting completely beat down with messages. We can only send a message every 16 milliseconds at most. And that's it. And actually, it kind of does remind me. Maybe we won't get to much review today. Maybe I hope we, we get to some. But just one last thing, I swear, and then we'll get to some review. Is uh Towers, I never uh I never took you to the the front end. So the front end for towers is the same thing. It's a canvas and that's it for the HTML and no CSS. And everything is done in JavaScript. So the view is going to take the game state, parse all the JSON, and then render everything to the screen. This is going to have your squares and circles, uh, rectangles, etc. Uh, this is just going to render everything to the screen, get the right colors, just visualize. But the whole view is in this one file. Uh, it's on the VOD, so I guess me scrolling through it, you could, if you're really curious, you can uh, look through that code. And then the controller is going to maintain those key states and every time a key is uh, event of up or down is registered we're gonna send update that key state and then send it to the server so if uh, the key state change every time the key state changes broadcast that to the server so not a whole lot going on on the front end of that most of it's in just building the GUI building the view so the users can see what's going on Okay, let's close this. And with that, I'll take a, a quick breath and then uh, we'll see what we're going to review today. Let's start. Let's get at least one of these out there. Let me refresh and see what's got the most upvotes. I thought I saw an eight. Oh, my eyes. No, I thought that was an eight. That's a five. All right, seven updates. Votes. Can you possibly go over LO4? Oh, the whole learning objective? More specifically, oh, good. Four, two, and three. Been having a difficult time understanding them. Same here, particularly four, three. I'm having problems with four, two. Plus one for four, three. Possibly four, four. I'm also struggling with four, three. The most mentions there is 4.3. I could start with that. 4.2 and 4.3, those are about two different topics. One's linked lists and one's uh, uh, binary trees. Let me refresh just to make absolute sure. Oh, the backlog? I, I thought that was one of the... I was hoping that would be one of the easier ones, I should say. Uh, it does use first order functions, so I can see that being tricky. And... Yeah, this one's tricky. Um, let's talk about the expression tree. I've heard quite a bit of questions about this outside of that post as well. Uh, and the TAs have been talking about it too, that they've been getting a lot of questions. So expression tree, I think this is the, the best use of our time if we can only go over one today. And then uh, for Wednesdays and Fridays lectures, I'll, I'll look through these and have a lot more prepared. Um, depending on how much justice I do to this right now, I might go over this one again as well. Um, 
since I'm doing this one on the fly pretty much right now. So an expression tree So let's get a, a good example of an expression tree on screen. An expression tree is going to start to evaluate an expression tree. You're starting at the root and evaluating that oper operator. You evaluate that by taking the left-hand child as the left-hand side of the operator and the right-hand child, the right child as the right-hand side of that operator. So this is the subtraction of 12 minus 4 and 8 plus 9 divided by 3 would be the the entire expression here. So of course this is a traversal you need to be thinking recursion and for this we need to evaluate the left we need to evaluate the right and both of these in our recursion and our recursive calls if we recursively call evaluate on the left and right they're both going to return integer or doubles. They're both going to return numbers to us. So after both of my recursive calls, then I can evaluate this node and say whatever number this recursive call gave me minus whatever number this recursive call gave me, return the subtraction of those two numbers. So this is going to lead us to a post order traversal. I need to evaluate the left, evaluate the right, then evaluate the node that I'm currently visiting. So if our recursion says, if my node is an operand, return that operand, dot two double done. If it's an operator, think post order traversal, recursive call on the left, recursive call on the right, those are both going to return numbers and then evaluate. So somewhere in your code, what I recommend, because you have to be able to tell, these are all strings, you have to be able to tell whether it's an operator or an operand. The only four operators we have in this lecture question are plus, minus, multiplication, and division. So you should have a line of code that says, if the value at this node is a the plus sign is this string, this string, this string, or this string. I got myself an operator. Go into post order traversal mode. Make the recursive calls and evaluate using those recursive calls. If it's the plus sign, add them. If it's the minus sign, subtract them, you know, etc. for the other two. If it's not any of these four, else I got myself an operand. We're going to assume that it's a well-formed double, so we don't have to have extra error checking. And uh, you know, this could get out of hand if we have to check for errors. If we had to check for imbalanced trees, for example, if we had or improperly structured trees, if we had twelve minus plus with no children, uh, we don't have to check for anything like that. If you have an operator, you can assume each subtree is going to evaluate to a number. So if it's not, if the value is not one of these four, you know you have an operand, and if it's, since it's well-formed, we're going to assume it's well-formed, you can just slap it with a dot two double. So if one of these four go into recursive mode, else we have a well-formed double, we've hit our base case, convert that to a double and return it. If it's one of these expressions, recursive call on the left and right child, those are both going to return doubles because we're going to assume our recursion is correct. And then either multiply, divide, add, or subtract those two values and return that. <laughs> I'm good on this, so I'll see you Wednesday. It's not like I'm going to just stop right now. I'll be here till 350. Uh... But if you got something else to do, I didn't mean this is the only thing I was going to go over. It's the only thing I'll go over during lecture time, but I'm still going to hang out. Uh, does anybody have more questions on this? I, I mean, this is a tricky one, but now that I'm looking at it, I mean, I put all the hints right in here, except explicitly saying you know, do post-order traversal if this is the case. 
time to speed run. There were a lot of students speed running this week. Way more than I wanted to. I think next semester I have to have more. Well, before I say this, we're obviously going into the chat. And, and during chat, and if somebody has questions about lecture questions and just wants to use this as review, I'd be happy to do that. But I will uh, repeat things on Wednesday and Friday if they appear in the Piazza post. If they appear in the Piazza post and are asked at the, this time, um, you know, I'll talk about them twice.